Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the next class today. Uh, this one we're going to be talking about space science, as you can see on the schedule. Taking off my space helmet here, my trusty, trusty space helmet. My name is James and I am going to be working through the data with you today. Uh, you'll notice that I'm dressed a little bit differently than normal. We are having Spirit Week here at the Delphian School. Uh, yesterday was um, like, a, like a country pride day, Patriot Day, wear the, the colors of your country, the colors of your flag. So I had, had on red, white, and blue yesterday. Uh, today is Jersey Day, Wait, wear a jersey or colors from your favorite sports team. Um, uh, this is the University of Oregon logo here. This is University of Michigan. Uh, I'm a fan of both, so this just happens to be perfect. Uh, tomorrow is Wacky Hair Day. Thursday, when you see me on Thursday, Thursday is Twin Day. Uh, I'm going to twin up with someone else and we're going to wear the same outfit. And Friday is Green Day. Uh, the school colors here at Delphian are green and white, so every once in a while we'll have a green day. Everyone wears as much green as they can. So. If you want to join along on this Spirit Week from afar, I am happy for you guys to join us. So tomorrow's wacky hair. Thursday is twin day, dress the same as someone else. Friday is green day, wear as much green as you possibly can. Okay, popping into the Q&A section really quick. Hello to everyone that, are, that is saying hello. Um, ooh, Ian's asking if there's a thing called a blood moon. Yeah, so, I'm actually fuzzy on the exact definition of a blood moon, but I do know that it's it, the moon is the moon isn't always the same distance from us. Um, it's on average, I think, two hundred thirty-eight thousand miles. That's just guessing off the top of my head, trying to remember. But it's in that kind of range. But it drifts a little bit closer, a little bit farther away. So sometimes a full moon feels like it's bigger than normal because it is. Uh, because it's closer, so it looks bigger to us just by a little bit, but it's enough. Um, and it, when it's really, so it's big moon, it's closer, it's low in the sky, there's a lot of dust and stuff in the atmosphere. It can look really red when it's really low on the horizon. It looks like blood. It's awesome. Okay, good. Oh, well, that was asking what's uh, today's Spirit Week day. Today is Jersey Day or Sports Day. So you know, we're wearing sports stuff. And these are my favorite college teams. Great, Katya says she has a soccer game, so she's gonna wear her soccer jersey. Great, excellent. Um, <laughs> Ved is, Ved, you're hired. You are asking about the comet, and that is actually the very first thing I wanna talk about today. So the general topic that we're gonna be talking about today is um, the history of space exploration. How have we explored our solar system in space so far? And then later in the week, we're gonna talk about what's coming in the future, what's happening right now, and what's coming in the future. But first, I wanted to talk about C2020F3, otherwise known as NEOWISE, otherwise known as the comet that you can see with your eyeballs in the sky tonight. So C2020F3 is the official letter number designation given to it. Uh, the name of the telescope that first discovered this comet was NEOWISE. A group of astronomers working at the NEOWISE telescope discovered it. So people are calling it the NEOWISE comet because it's easier to say than C slash 2020F3. Um, this is a real picture taken from someone uh, with a much better camera than, than, than I have. Uh, but that is what the comet looks like in the night sky. Here's another picture here. This is a little bit closer to what I saw last night. I went out and spotted it last night um, right after sunset, shortly after sunset and shortly before sunrise are the two best times to see this comet. Um, here's another picture. Boy, that's gorgeous. Look at those clouds there. And there's one more. This, this is very similar to what I saw. So the best times to see this, I saw this about 10 o'clock last night, 10, 10.30 last night, maybe a half hour, 45 minutes after the sun went down, or I am. And um, if you're looking out at the horizon, so if you're seeing it at sunset, look towards the west, look at where the sun was, and look relative to you about 
one or two inches above where the sun would be and about four or five, six inches to the right. That's the general location that you're gonna find this thing. And it's not super huge. It doesn't cover the entire sky, but if you, if you hold out your finger from where you are and you're looking at that, you're gonna be looking for something that's maybe as long as from that knuckle to the tip of your finger. It's about how was it how big it was for me. So if you hold your finger out, you kind of, it'll be about that big up on the horizon. Um, my friend had a pair of binoculars that made it a lot easier to spot. Um, the darker the sky is, the easier it will be to see. So you'll see it for about that first maybe hour or so right after sunset, and then it starts to kind of dip below the horizon. And then as morning approaches, it rises, the comet rises. It dips above the horizon again, and you'll be able to see it for an hour or so before the sun rises. Once the sun is up, the sky is too bright. You can't see the comet. But I hope that you take the opportunity to go out and find this thing, um, see it with your bare eyes, not just a picture of it. See it with your eyes or with a telescope or with a pair of binoculars because it's really incredible. The, the kind of light show that our universe will put on sometimes. Uh, if you don't see it now, don't worry. This comet is on an orbit around our sun and it'll, it will be back in 6,800 years. So if you miss, miss it this time, don't worry, just stick around for 6,800 years and you'll see it again. Uh, that's how long it takes for it to orbit. Um, and it'll be the perfect time to see it is going to be July 14th to 19th. So um, about the next five days or so. After that, you might still catch some glimpses, but this is the best time to view it. Okay, q and I've been talking, Q&A section is, uh, is having some action here. Good, 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 good. Oh, a lot, a lot of questions about the comet. Okay, it looks like I have asked, it looks like I've answered everything. Great, so for those of you just joining us, we were talking about the Neowise comet that is currently in our sky. And today we're gonna be talking about the history of space exploration. Um, it's one of my favorite, favorite um, subjects here. All right, one moment, please. Excellent. All right, thank you very much for your patience. Here we go, we're talking about space exploration. Before we can talk about actually humans going to space, we're gonna talk about science fiction. Uh, art, fiction, drawing, painting, telling stories, making now like movies and TV shows and stuff. Uh, the purpose of an artist, the role that an artist has in our society is to imagine things that don't exist yet, but could. And back in the late 1800s, I mean, we hadn't even invented flight. <laughs> Humans didn't fly in an airplane until the 1900s, the very early 1900s. But in the year 1865, when America was in the middle of a civil war, that didn't stop Jules Verne from imagining a moon ship. And you can see on the left side here, it's just basically a giant bullet or cannon shell fired up to the moon. He figured if you can shoot it fast enough, high enough, far enough, we should be able to get to the moon. You can see kind of a, I don't know if that's a person riding on that bullet there. 1865, he was way ahead of his time, Jules Verne was. Um, 1897, again, still several years before the Wright brothers would have their first flight in North Carolina, we had The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. This was a less happy story, a less happy book. Uh, Moonship was like, let's get in a ship and go to the moon. <laughs> War of the Worlds was Mars is attacking us and wiping out all of humanity. Um, and you can see, you know, it might look a little silly now. You've got these kind of steampunk looking alien ships with these tentacles and ray beams and stuff, but this was brand new stuff. No one had ever made a story like this. This was really out there. Artists push the bounds of what we think is possible. 
And then society catches up, the engineering, the science, the physics, if it's possible, humans then find a way. We dreamed about flying like birds for thousands of years. And finally, in the early 1900s, we accomplished that. We dreamed about going to space and within 100 years, we were in space. Um, let's fast forward to the early 20th century um, and science fiction became this very popular uh, topic, it's especially short stories, novels. You started getting you know, some early movies about it. And here on the left, you see this was probably 1920s, 1930s, that artists were having these visions of what it could look like to travel to other planets. And you can see this rocket here. Looks like these astronauts have maybe had some problems with the rocket. They landed on this planet that has volcanoes and stuff. Looks like the rocket's on fire a little bit. Maybe they're running away before it explodes or try to get some stuff to fix it. But look at the general design there. It's silvery. It's got a point in the front. Uh, you've got kind of these wings coming off of it. And on the right side, you see this is an actual prototype of a new spaceship that SpaceX is building. Um, and you can see the design. There's, there's a lot of familiar parts to it. It's silvery. It's pointed in the front. You've got these wings on the front and on the back. Um, so you can see there's kind of an echo between what science fiction envisioned and what we actually ended up building. That's just a prototype. It's a test model. Um, it's not made to fly. It's just made to show this is what it could look like so that they can continue to develop it. Okay. Uh, Aubrey asked in the Q&A section, what's the difference between a meteor and a meteorite? Good. So what we're seeing in the sky with Neowise I'm going to rewind a little bit here. There's Neowise, is a comet. Now this comet is about, checking my notes real quick, it's about three miles across. Um, comets are big, dirty snowballs, basically. It's a lot of water ice and some dust and rocks in there, but mostly it's ice. And as it gets close to the sun, the ice starts to evaporate and, and the water, and it, there's like a water trail behind it, which is, that. So, um, uh, so that's a comet. A meteor would be uh, more rocky, more rocky or metal than ice. And a meteor is when it's coming down into our atmosphere, hitting our atmosphere, and it starts burning up. And you can see this red fiery trail sometimes behind it as it hits our atmosphere and gets really hot and burns. So a meteor is when it's coming into our atmosphere and sometimes it doesn't fully disintegrate in our atmosphere. Sometimes a chunk of that metal or rock survives all the way to the surface and you can find it on the ground. Sometimes it's as big as your hands. Sometimes it's as small as this scrap of paper that I put my chewing gum in. <laughs> and um, at that point it's called a meteorite. Meteorite, it's on the ground, you can find it there. Meteor is when it's still in the sky. Comet, giant dirty snowball out in space that the sun lights up. Okay. <clears throat> um, Raghav, no, you don't have to write anything down. Feel free to take notes in this class um, if you want to, so that you can go back to and refer to it yourself. But also, every recording of every class that we do today, tomorrow, last week, all the way back through March when we started doing these, it's all available on Delphian's YouTube page. So that's one example of science fiction, just an artist having an idea, and it actually finds its way into the real world years later. Uh, here's another example of that. Here's Astounding Science Fiction, which was a great, uh, very popular, famous science fiction magazine. They would publish short stories. This is from February, 1939. And here's this uh, design of a spaceship that is, looks like they've crashed on this planet and looks like one person died and they buried them with a cross. And here's these two people climbing away from the wreckage. And here is, again, an actual concept for a spaceship that is under development right now from SpaceX. And again, you can see flavors of these early sci-fi artists um, finding their way into modern actual rockets. 
Um, here is a, here's just another great cover from Astounding Science Fiction. You know, it's this space station looks like it's disintegrating. There's some ships flying away from it. Um, this is a quote from our headmaster at the Delphin School, Trevor Ott. I really like it. In times like these, it is possible to get the idea that the ground we are standing on isn't stable enough to build on, to build upon. But that notion is false. The future is built first and foremost with ideas, and ideas are not dependent on the physical world. An individual doesn't need stable ground to throw a big idea far, far into the future. In fact, many of history's inventions, inspirations, and renaissances were created by individuals during the most unstable and unpredictable of times. Just as an example, going back here really quick, here's Jules Verne, 1865. I actually don't know Jules Verne's nationality. I don't know what country he was from. But 1865, the United States was tearing itself apart in a civil war. And Jules Verne is thinking, let's go to the moon. 1897, there was various conflicts around the world. And here's H.G. Wells thinking, what if Martians invaded and humanity banded together to fight them off. Unstable times, but amazing concepts. February 1939, World War II is just about to get started. And here's this guy, you know, the, this artist, imagining what it's like to go to another world. So I love that quote from our headmaster. Speaking of World War II, the first rockets the first objects that humans ever sent into space were not instruments of peace, but were instruments of war. This is a picture of a V-2 rocket, v, the, like the letter V. And Nazi Germany was developing these rockets and they had some basic guidance systems. They would take them on these mobile launchers and drive them close to the coast of Germany or France or wherever they were positioned. And they would launch them and these things would go flying far up to the very edge of space. Um, sorry, just going to my notes here really quick. So the, these V-2 missiles would fly up, they would go up 60 miles high, right to the edge of space there. And then they would come dropping down onto England. The Germans were trying to hit London. And um, they would come in, these things would fly more than 200 miles. They would go 60 miles up. And when they came down, they were going be going 3,500 miles per hour. These things created a lot of panic in England and a lot of problems because you couldn't see them coming. They were too fast. You couldn't hear them coming. They were too fast. All of a sudden, there would just be an explosion. These things were packed with just a bunch of explosives and it could destroy buildings and stuff like that. A really nasty weapon of war. Uh, but the lessons that were being learned by the engineers in there would be used for peace later on. We'll talk about that. Um, gonna catch up on the Q&A section really, really quick. All right, wow, you guys are really great. This is, um, I, I'm loving all the questions in here. If I don't get the opportunity to answer your question during the live broadcast today, uh, stick around when I'm done talking and after the camera cuts, because I, I like to try to go back and answer as many questions by typing in the Q&A section as I can. Okay, so not a great beginning. You know, these bombs were dropped on people. They killed people. Not cool, not nice. But we, were, we, we started to be able to, um, what's in the middle there? There we go. We started to be able to use those lessons for peaceful things. After World War II ended, um, scientists from Germany, scientists from America, scientists from Russia, um, they had already been working on this idea of a rocket. You send something across the earth or up into space. Germany was farther than everyone else on this. And after Germany was defeated, the scientists and the engineers that were working in Germany some went to Russia, some went to the United States and helped start the space programs of those two nations. Um, the United Kingdom, Britain was also very involved in this. Here you have, you see some concepts here from NASA on rockets going up to space. Here's an idea for a rocket orbiting the moon. Um, different, some of these designs look very 
familiar, very similar to what ended up happening. This kind of looks like the Saturn V rocket, which ended up sending astronauts to the moon. And German engineers, German scientists were very involved in America's efforts to get men to the moon and very involved in Russia, in the Soviet Russia's efforts to get satellites into space, men into space, get probed out to Venus and Mars and explore our solar system. So it started in times of war, turned into an instrument of peace. All right. Uh, Joseph says, I think Elon Musk is completely taking over the space exploration world. Um, yes and no. I kind of agree with you on that to a degree. I mean, I'm, you can see from my laptop here, uh, there we go. I do like SpaceX. I like it a lot. There we go. <laughs> I like it a lot, but they're not the only people. They're not the only company uh, making significant progress in space. They're making some of the most visible progress at the moment, but there's a lot of companies and a lot of countries that are making huge advances right now. We're, we are in the second space race as we speak right now. And it's a lot more cooperative than the first one. So catching up in, in my notes here really quick. So the United States and Russia, they were both racing each other. This was called the space race. Nice catchy title, right? Um, the Soviets, the Russians had America beat every step of the way, every step of the way. Um, Russia caught America completely off guard when in October of 1957, uh, they launched Sputnik, the first satellite, the first man-made satellite to go into space and orbit the planet. And Sputnik is the Russian word meaning traveling companion. Um, you'll find there's a theme of really cool names that the Russians picked for their spacecraft throughout their history. And this thing went up and you can see from the picture there, it's, it's not big. It's no bigger than the desk I'm sitting at right now. And it was a very simple thing. And all it did is it went up and it orbited the planet and it gave out this radio signal, just this beeping noise so that anyone on earth could take a radio, tune into a certain frequency and hear it beeping. And so they knew it was flying over. The United States was, uh, the United States government was kind of freaked out by this. They're like, oh no, the Soviets have stuff in space. Maybe they can put a bomb up there. They can put spy satellites up there. Um, <laughs> this was not a race of peace. This was a, a race of, we want to make sure that the other side cannot obliterate us. So there's this kind of ongoing balance between peaceful people wanting to do things for science, motivated by the concept of we don't want the other side to win. Um, here's a diagram of Sputnik, very simple on the inside. There's not a lot of complicated stuff happening in here. There's some batteries, there's a radio transmitter, these, um, these spikes, <laughs> these spines coming off of it were like antenna, very simple design, but the Soviets proved we can send something up into space and it works. Shortly after that, I think a few weeks or months later, the Americans had their own stuff up in space. Maybe more on the order of months. America wasn't ready for this. They, they were kind of caught off guard. Um, Russia didn't stop. They put the first animals up into space. They put, they put dogs up into space first and they were able to prove that living creatures could exist in space if you had them in a pressurized capsule, right? There's no atmosphere in space. So you take the atmosphere with you in your spacecraft. Um, April 12th, 1961 is one of the most important days in human history. And that is the day that Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space went to space. This very brave Russian man went up and um, went, Orbited, came back, survived the trip, and went into the history books. It's one of the most famous humans in our history. And to this day, there's still a celebration called Yuri's Night, um, where the space community celebrates space, space exploration, and it's named after this guy, Yuri Gagarin, who was the first man to go up. 
Um, so the United States was trying to catch up to the Soviets. So uh, 1957, Sputnik was launched. 1958, America created NASA. And um, before that, there, America had a space program. I forget if it was part of the Air Force or something like that. But finally, 1958, America was like, we are making an organization that is very specifically about space, space exploration, rocket development, stuff like this. And that was NASA. So in this picture here, uh, we have President Dwight D. Eisenhower. And um, on the right here, you see Keith Glennon. He is the first administrator of NASA. And over here is Dr. Hugh Dryden as the deputy administrator for NASA. So here's the president saying, all right, guys, you're in charge. <laughs> Get to work. Russia is well ahead of us. So NASA, it stands for National Aeronautics and Space Administration. National meaning related to a nation, so in America. Uh, aeronautics is the science of traveling through the air. Space is the area between planets and stars, of course. And an administration is part of a government that handles a specific thing. So in America, we have like the Food and Drug Administration. That's the section of the government that is in charge of food and drugs and making sure that you know they're they're safe and people are not putting out lettuce that's going to make people sick and stuff like that. So NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, big words, simple concept. And down here we have the two NASA logos that have existed over the years. This was their first one. This is called the worm because it kind of looks like a worm going along making the letters. And over here is what's called the meatball. This is a more recent version of the logo. Both logos are still in use. There's members of the space community that like the worm better, and there's members of the space community that like the meatball better. I like them both. Both is good. I like both. Okay. Um, Raghav asks, what year did the space race start? I don't know if there was an exact year. Um, in my mind, it started in 1945, as soon as World War II was over, and America and Russia were both trying to get German scientists to come work for them. Um, it really picked up in 1957, after Sputnik was launched. It really signaled, like, okay, there is a race, and America's losing, and Russia's winning. That was the first real big milestone of, like, guys, this is a competition. Um, let's see. Oh, let ask, why is there a picture of a girl on the logo for Yuri's night if Yuri was a boy? Well, because men and women are both space explorers. Um, shortly after Yuri went up, not only did Russia have the first man in space, Russia put the first woman in space. And, um, you know, men and women, they're both amazing explorers and we need skills of every type up in space. And the question is just, who's the best person for the job? Um, many of the commanders of space shuttle missions were women just because they were the most qualified. They were the best at their job, so they got the job. I love it. I have a daughter and a son, and I would love for them both to go into space if they wanted to. I'm not going to force them. Totally up to them. But I would welcome that decision if they made it. All right, Ranbir suggested that the dual that the two logos be called spaghetti and meatball. <laughs> I love it. I'm gonna steal that, Ranbir. Thank you very much. Um, all right. So Joseph asked if Russia was in front of the Americans, how did the Americans manage to win the space race? We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. It's very very interesting. All right. Sam is asking, do I have a favorite spacecraft? Ooh, if so, which one? All right, I want your answers in the Q&A section on this as well. My favorite spacecraft. I have to think about this because there's so many great ones. And there's so many great reasons for them. The Apollo capsule, the Apollo spacecraft got us to the moon. I wouldn't ride in one now. We've come a long way, but hey, it got people to the moon and it got them back safely. 
So I'd have to say that's my favorite. Which one would I most want to ride in? <laughs> it's the newest, the bestest, the most, uh, the safest, the most well-designed. Right now, that would be the, um, the SpaceX Crew Dragon capsule. And that Apollo capsule, guys, you know, it's, it put us on the moon. So it's, it's got to be my favorite there. Evan saying Apollo, same with Adit. Um, Alette loves the Saturn V. Yeah, so the Saturn V rocket with the Apollo capsule on top, that, that teamwork, that combination. Saturn V, Apollo. Milo loves the space shuttle. Milo. I love a good space shuttle. The space shuttle had its problems, but I don't think there's been a more gorgeous spacecraft. I don't think there's been a, a prettier spacecraft in humankind than the space shuttle. It had issues. It's fine that we don't use it anymore, but man, was that thing pretty. All right. Arush, ah, the Blue Moon capsule by Amazon. Yeah, Jeff Bezos' company from, uh, Blue, from Blue Origin. That Blue Moon capsule is pretty pretty. I like that. Good. Lots of, lots of opinions here, guys. I like it. One more question here that I'll ask all of you that's being asked here. Oh, well, let me find it again. Oh, no. I'm so sorry. Hang on. The question disappeared. Ah, Nicole asked, if you could go anywhere in space, where would you go? I want your answers on this as well. And um, I think the moon would be pretty cool. Space Station is the first stop, okay? The moon would be awesome. I think Mars, though. Mars would have to be the place I want to go the most. It's very Earth-like. Um, it's got weaker gravity than us. It's got a weak atmosphere. But I think that's where a lot of the next amazing milestones in space science are going to happen. I would love to be there and be part of it, part of a Mars base. Um, I don't think I'm going. I don't have the right training. There's people out there that are way more qualified than me, and that's okay. If I can use my interest and my excitement about space to help inspire others to go, that makes me very happy. If I had a student who ended up living on Mars in the future, using some of the things that I helped teach them, I would be thrilled. I would be honored. And I would love to have, I don't know, maybe a plant named after me or something like that. Okay, so Jackson would like to go to the moon. Raghav would like to go to Venus. Milo says, I would go to another habitable planet. Milo, like usual, you're way ahead of me on this. I love it. Alette would go to the Oort cloud and Mars. Uh, Tanisha would want to go to Saturn. Uh, Ved would go to the nearest non-hostile alien civilization. I really like the way you worded that. Very specific. <laughs> Jackson would go to the moon and the space station. Evan would want to go to Jupiter so we can make a snowman. Uh, Sam would definitely want to go to another Goldilocks planet, but if we can't yet, just space in general. It's awesome. Arush would go to the moon. Nicole would go everywhere. Oh, man. Tanisha would also want to go to a planet that isn't discovered yet. We have a class of explorers and astronomers and physicists and engineers here right now. This is amazing. You guys are a dream team. I love it. All right. Um, so America wasn't too far behind Russia in putting a man up in space. Here we have, so Yuri, April 12th, 1961, Yuri Gagarin went into space. Well, just a little bit later, 5 May, 1961, less than a month later, America put Alan Shepard up into space. He did not orbit the planet at first. He was, he just went up, he was up there, I think 12 minutes or something officially in space, he came back down. But still, we put a dude in space and he survived and that was very important. Look at this capsule that he was in over here. This tiny little tin can, it's like a soup can. It's like an oversized soup can that he was in. That is a brave, brave man right there. And here he is meeting President John F. Kennedy and, um, <laughs> what a moment. What an amazing moment. Uh, it wasn't all fun and games. Not everyone who went into the space race came out the other side. Um, Russia lost men in various accidents on the ground and in space. Um, the first astronauts that America lost were uh, from Apollo 1. 
They weren't even flying. They were sitting on the launch pad doing tests. They were suited up. They were in, a, in the Apollo 1 capsule on the launch pad doing some tests and a fire broke out in the capsule on January 7th, the 27th, 1967. And Virgil Grissom, Edward White and Roger Chaffee um, perished in that accident. Here's a picture from inside the capsule afterwards and the burned to a crisp. And it was really, a, it was a really hard time for America because Russia had beat us every step of the way and every major milestone. Um, we were trying to get, trying to beat Russia on something, anything. And here we had this tragic accident happen and we had to stop. America stopped and looked at where do we go from here? How fast do we go? How fast can we go while keeping our men safe? And a lot of changes were made after that Apollo 1 uh, accident. Um, changes were made to safety procedures and to the engineering and to, you know, what, what kind of air did they put inside the capsules? They changed a lot of stuff and it became a lot safer afterwards. And each step going forward was a little bit safer, a little bit smarter. So they learned from their mistake. Um, Apollo 8, you know, we got ourselves picked back up after Apollo 1. Apollo 8 was the first mission to go launched from the Earth, and it orbited the Earth a little bit, and then it fired its engines and went on this orbit out, and it went around the moon, didn't land, and came back and landed on Earth. Huge, huge moment. And then finally, July 24th, 1969, the big milestone for the space race itself and what America believes won the space race, landing a man on the moon. I say what America believes won the space race because there was no exact rules to it. It was just <laughs> who can do the coolest stuff up there. Russia, I'm going to guess, could have beat America to landing a man on the moon. But America was trying to do one thing in space. America was trying to land a man on the moon. Russia was trying a bunch of different stuff. They were exploring or getting more satellites up and expanding satellite technology. They were working on getting probes landed on the moon and on Venus and on Mars. They were working on space stations. They were already envisioning space stations. So if Russia was working on many different things. America just wanted to get to the moon and they did. And all of those things, there was a lot of advances made on all of that, but this is just a great historic moment right there. Uh, okay. I need to catch up on a few questions. Oh, Lauren is asking, who is Elon Musk? Elon Musk is the founder of the company SpaceX. Whoop. And he is, um, SpaceX is one of the companies really pushing the boundaries of space exploration and uh, rocket and spacecraft development right now. Um, so that's who Elon Musk is. Catching up on some more questions. Okay, I think that has captured most of most of the questions here. I'm going to move on so we get through some of the final slides here. There's the mission patch for Apollo 11. There's an eagle landing on the moon. That's cool. Uh, so these guys, right? So again, it wasn't all fun and games. It's not just you land on the moon and you jump around and you have a good time. Stuff continued to go wrong every once in a while. Um, Apollo 11 landed on the moon, Apollo 12 landed on the moon, Apollo 13 was on the way, and then on the way to the moon, one of their oxygen tanks blew up. So they lost a bunch of oxygen, it damaged the spacecraft really bad. They lost any chance of landing on the moon. Um, and let's see, this is Jim Lovell, Jack Swigert, and Fred Hayes. And they survived this explosion on their spacecraft. And there's a really incredible movie from the 1990s with Tom Hanks and it. it's called Apollo 13. If you haven't seen Apollo 13, I highly suggest watching that movie. There's a lot of really great science in there. You learn a lot, it's entertaining, it's informative, it's a great story. They survive in the end. Spoilers, but I don't care. <coughs> great movie, watch it. And um, just amazing science, it's a, it's a story of humans coming together, figuring out a problem that would otherwise kill them. 
Um, humans kept going back to the moon. America sent several more missions, Apollo 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, and 17 all landed on the moon. Uh, here's a picture from, I think it's Apollo 16 or 17. Those are the missions that had uh, rovers. They had little cars that they brought up with them. There was an Apollo 18 that was, um, it was scheduled, the spacecraft was built, they wanted to send it up, but um, the United States has started shifting its attention and its, its finances, its money elsewhere. So there wasn't money for Apollo 18 that canceled that mission, but uh, the spacecraft was already built. So, oh, there's, there's a great photo. I love that, super cool. Um, but hey, they had built another Apollo spacecraft, it was ready to go. And with the space race being quote unquote over, um, the United States and Russia stopped competing directly against each other so much and started looking for ways to cooperate in space. And um, someone had this idea of, hey, what if we have an American spacecraft dock with a Soviet spacecraft in space? How amazing would that be? So America took that last Apollo capsule. There's the Apollo 18 capsule there. They built this special airlock on the front of it that could connect to the Russian Soyuz capsule. That's the name of the capsule that the Russians were sending up. Soyuz means union, coming together. And um, we still use Soyuz capsules today. Almost every astronaut that's gone to the space station in the last nine years has gone up on a Russian Soyuz capsule. These things are very well built, very well engineered. They just, they just, they just don't break. <laughs> Nothing really goes wrong very often with them. They're, they're very well designed. So July 1975, you had the Apollo, the Apollo Soyuz mission where they docked, they rendezvoused in space. And it started this great tradition of America and Russia working together to you know, figure out new stuff in space. America and Russia both started developing space stations. Uh, and this was something that Russia was a lot better at than America for a long time because they were putting more resources. They were putting more effort and attention into it. Here you have the American Skylab space station, which was a pretty good project for us. We, we started doing more science up in space rather than just going up in space just to live just to survive, we started doing science, bringing experiments up and learning more about living in space, microgravity, the effects of sun radiation, stuff like that. Uh, the Russians had Mir. This is obviously a far more impressive space station than Skylab right there. Um, and Mir, let's see. So Mir is a Russian word. It means, it means peace. Uh, it also means world. It also means village. It doesn't have a perfect, super exact translation into English, but it's this word that has these multiple meanings to it. Here's a village in space, and it means peace. This is not a, an instrument of war. It's an instrument of peace. And so throughout the 70s and 80s, America and Russia started working more closely. And then the Soviet Union collapsed in the late 80s. And there was this question of what happens? Like there were, there were Soviet citizens on the Mir space station when the Soviet Union collapsed, it no longer existed. So these men went up as Soviet citizens and they came back as Russian citizens. Their country had changed while they were in space. And America had this idea for a much bigger space station. Uh, it, it was a project called Space Station Freedom. And it was started, they started thinking about it in the early 80s and different ideas and concepts were gone through. Finally, they were like, you know what? Russia is better with space stations than we are. They know how to operate a space station. They know how to keep it uh, repaired and keep it functional and keep it resupplied. They know how to keep humans alive for long durations in space. Let's invite the Russians into the Space Station Freedom Project. Um, many countries in Europe were involved, Japan was involved. The name was changed from Space Station Freedom to the International Space Station. And that is what we have today. And I did not put a picture of that on the slide, but <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that more in a, in a later class here. 
Let's see anything else. There's a space shuttle. That's very pretty. That's a whole separate class. We could talk about that for a long time. Um, okay. I had to skip a few slides because we are out of time. Stick around in the Q&A section for a few minutes. I'm, even after the, the, the camera turns off, I'm going to try to answer some more questions um, by text in the Q&A section. I'm so glad that you all joined me today. Join me again on Thursday. We're going to be talking about, now we've looked at the history of space exploration. What's happening right now in space? What are some current space missions and some future ones that are coming up? We're going to talk about that. Uh, if you have questions, comments, topics you'd like us to discuss, something about space that you'd like me to go, go into more detail about, online learning at delphian.org is the email address that you can send those to. Uh, thank you very much. You're an amazing group. I love your questions. I love your answers. I'm going to pop my space helmet back on. And I'll see you all on Thursday.